now we can talk about how to know if you have a limit cycle or tests for limit cycles. If you have a system that you suspect has one or you suspect doesn't have one, are there tools to prove that or demonstrate it? So that's what we're gonna to get to now. So we can test for limit cycles or we could rule them out. Some of these are analytical, some of these are geometric. In this class, I'm emphasizing not just, oh, let's just plug it into some ODE solver and see. We wanna get some insight into more of the geometry, knowing ahead of time what type of system it is, if you could just totally rule things out. So yeah, you could just plot with a face portrait plotter and see. And often that's done as a first step. You do numerics, numerical exploration. That's how a lot of things start out. And then later you come up with some theory as to why you observed what you observed. So that perfectly legitimate form of doing things. So one way to test for limit cycles is you could use index theory. A limit cycle is just one type of closed orbit. So we could, we could try to rule out closed orbits. So one way to do that would be index theory. How could we use index theory? If we have a closed orbit in the real plane, R2, it must encircle fixed points whose indices add up to plus one. So if you have a region of phase space, you come up with a closed contour, not necessarily a closed orbit, just some kind of contour. And there either are no fixed points in there or the fixed points have indices that don't add up to plus one, then there's no periodic orbit that's possible. So you could rule things out that way. So you could use index theory. Another way, which we referred to when we talked about systems with special structure in 2D is gradient systems. So if your system is a gradient system, remember what a gradient system was? Um, we wrote it in vector form this way, the negative gradient of some scalar function V, which meant X dot is negative partial V partial X, Y dot is negative partial V partial Y. If you have a system that has that form, there can be no periodic orbits. The only thing that's possible is fixed points. And you could use this idea for other things that aren't even gradient systems. You could use this idea, an adaptation of it is to use a Lyapunov function. So even if your system is not a gradient system, and I spell Lyapunov this way, some people spell Lyapunov with L-I-A, Lyapunov. If you can find a Lyapunov function, and I'll tell you what a Lyapunov function is, then closed orbits are forbidden. So a Lyapunov function, a continuously differentiable scalar function of the phase space with uh, the following properties. One, the value is greater than zero for all X that are not equal to fixed points and V at a fixed point is equal to zero. So if you want a picture in mind, here's our function V over X and Y, and then there's a fixed point down here at the zero value. So this is a condition on V. This is also referred to as uh, saying that V is positive definite. Maybe you've heard of a positive definite matrix here, we're referring to a positive definite function. The other condition is on how V changes along trajectories. So this is that V dot is at any point X is less than zero. So V is going down for all X that are not equal to a fixed point. So all trajectories are going downhill towards, locally downhill towards fixed points, which means you can't have a periodic orbit because a periodic orbit would not be able to do this, right? So everything is kind of going that way, locally downhill. So the intuition is that all trajectories move monotonically down the graph of this V towards a fixed point. Now there's a drawback to this. There's no systematic way to construct Lyapunov functions. In this case, we're using Lyapunov functions to rule out a periodic orbit. Lyapunov functions are used in the study of control theory, nonlinear control theory. But again, there's that drawback. There's no systematic way to find them. It usually requires some inspiration and guessing. Okay, here's an example. X dot equals minus X plus 4Y. So that part's linear. And then Y dot is negative X minus Y 
cubed. And maybe we have some hunch that this system has no closed orbits for whatever reason. Maybe we plugged it into one of those phase plane plotters and we didn't see any. So we might, okay, well, what do we do? Typical guesses are that V of X is the magnitude of X squared. So in this case, X squared plus Y squared, which we could try here. I happen to know this might not work. Some variation of it might work. How about this? X squared plus some constant times Y squared, where A is some parameter that we'll choose later. A is greater than or equal to zero. We can verify property one. So property one is satisfied because of how we've chosen V. Property two is the tricky one. If we take V dot D by DT of V, which is a function of X and Y. So now we have to use the chain rule. So this is 2x, x dot plus 2ay, y dot, and plug in x dot and y dot from up there. We'll get negative 2x squared, skipping some steps, rearranging 8 minus 2a, x, y minus 2a, y to the fourth. We can make the x, y term go away. So this is 0 if a equals 4. Okay, so if we've got if if we do that, then we get um, negative two x squared minus eight y to the fourth. This is always going to be negative, except at the fixed point at zero. So this is always less than zero for all x and y that are not the origin. It's pretty clear the origin is a fixed point here. So one and two are satisfied. We found this for A equals four. Therefore, for this system, there are no closed orbits. In fact, all the trajectories just approach the origin because one of the uses of the Lyapunov function is to prove that the fixed point thing at the bottom of your function V, the bottom of the Lyapunov function is asymptotically stable. So everything's heading for it. There's no closed orbits, but you know, th there was some guesswork involved here. It wasn't obvious. Like, what if I had tried this? Well, I would have gotten a V dot that uh, could be positive or negative. But I had some insight that, well, if I you know, leave in that A and leave it as a parameter to be determined, then we could figure something out. Still under the ruling out closed orbits. There's also something called Dulock's criterion. So this is another method, and it's based on Green's theorem. We're assuming we've got a continuously differentiable vector field. And it's defined on a simply connected subset of the plane. What is that? So here's a simply connected subset. We'll call that R. It's a subset of the plane. You're like, what's an example of a subset that's not. If this had a hole, then that wouldn't work. So this is simply connected. This thing with a hole, not simply connected. The region with a hole in it will be useful later, but not yet. And then there's the tricky part. If there exists a scalar function g such that the gradient of g times x dot has one sign, meaning it's either always positive or always negative, if it has one side throughout this region, simply connected region, then there are no closed orbits lying entirely in that region. There are no closed orbits, at least lying entirely in the region R. Now, the problem again with this, uh, just like with the Lyapunov function is, there's no algorithm for finding what G of X is. There's some candidates no systematic way to get G. So you just sort of try some and see what happens. Sometimes G equal to just one works. Something that's one over X raised to the A, Y raised to the B, or A and B or something. Or maybe um, E to the AX. There's different things that you could do. So for example, suppose we have a hunch that some particular system doesn't have closed orbits, at least in a particular region. So here's a, here's a system. It looks kind of like the rabbits and sheep, but it's not the rabbits and sheep. We'll just limit ourselves to the, the, the first quadrant. So that'll be our region R. 
So here's X and Y. So we want to see if, can we pick some G that satisfies this, the divergence of G times X dot has one sign throughout R. Okay. I'm going to go with this guess and say, well, maybe A and B equal one. I just have some intuition about that. Let's try G equals one over X, Y. Then we can calculate this thing. The divergence of G times X dot is equal to what? Uh, so this is just partial, partial X of uh, G X dot plus partial, partial Y, G Y dot. This becomes two minus X minus Y over Y because the one over X took care of that. And then plus partial, partial Y, four X minus X squared minus three over X. Work out what those partial derivatives are, and you get that this is negative 1 over y. So that means this is going to be less than 0 throughout our positive quadrant, where x is greater than 0, y is greater than 0. It's a simply connected region, and g is continuously differentiable over r, and so is f. So Dulac's criterion implies that there's no closed orbits entirely in R. You know, there might be closed orbits that cross around, but at least we know, okay, there's nothing entirely in R. There's another powerful thing that instead of ruling out closed orbits, allows us to establish that closed orbits exist. The main one, it's called the poincare Ben Dixon theorem. Probably noticing we're encountering Poincaré's name quite a bit, and we'll continue to. Let me give you some supposes. Suppose that first that we'll have a region R that's a closed bounded subset of the plane. There's no restriction here on being uh, simply connected. So number two, uh, same thing that we've been assuming about our vector field, it's continuously differentiable in this region. Another thing we need, this might be the hard one, is that R does not contain any fixed points. We also need to establish, and this is another one that might be hard to establish, there exists a trajectory, and we'll call it C, that is confined to R in the sense that it starts in R and it stays in R for all future time. So the initial condition, if you want, is in R and then it stays in R for all future time. So that's what we suppose. Those are the assumptions. The theorem then says then that C is a closed orbit or it spirals towards a closed orbit as time goes to infinity. So in either case, the region R contains a closed orbit. The best regions have holes for using this theorem. So here would be our region R in yellow, some kind of distorted annulus. And there's no fixed points. So we've got we've got these other things satisfied. So if there is some trajectory that stays here, it starts in here and going forward, it stays in here, then that's either uh, a closed orbit or it's spiraling onto a closed orbit. In either case, right, these two trajectories, they stay in R for all, to all time. We could say either way, there is a closed orbit. Now, the way that we usually establish that there is a region R that could have a closed orbit is we construct R as a trapping region. So this is the typical approach. We construct a trapping region where the vector field along the boundaries is always pointing into the region. And hopefully that gives an idea of why it's called a trapping region. So it's pointing inward toward R. So if we have a, say an outer contour, the outer boundary, and we were to evaluate what the vector field's doing, the vector field needs to be pointing inward. It doesn't have to be normal pointing in, it just has to be pointing inward, it's not leaving. Which means if anything crosses that boundary, right? we've defined a surface that when things cross it, they're never going to cross back. So it's like a one-way flux. But then we have an inner boundary where the same thing happens, the vector field is pointing inward. These likely will not be circular regions. Um, we may have to have some weird deformed region, but then that becomes our trapping region. And then just knowing that the vector field points inward everywhere along the boundary means any trajectory that crosses into here must stay in here. So if we have a trajectory that's crossing in, I don't know what it's going to do, but it has to stay in here. That's just one part of it. The other part is establishing that there's no fixed points in R. 
establishing that there's no fixed points in R might be harder, but once you've got this, you've got two boundaries with the vector field pointing in. And if you can also establish that there's no fixed points, then there has to be a periodic orbit in there. This can be difficult to apply in practice. First of all, finding those contours where the vector field's always pointing inward and then establishing the no fixed points. I mean, why is that? Because if there was a fixed point, then maybe things are just, if there's a stable fixed point, things are going towards that fixed point. We don't want that. We'll look at examples of using Poincaré, Ben Dixon, and then some other things related to limit cycles next time.